All right. Awesome. Welcome to the Hip Hop Hustle podcast. I'm with the one and only Drex Carter. Uh, and Drex, man, I've been looking at what you've been doing over the past few years, and it's really impressive, not only the rise, but also the, the quality of music that you've been coming out. Uh, and Obviously, for anyone who isn't aware, but new album just dropped, Hath No Fury. It's 10 tracks. It's really good. Uh, I've been listening to it as well. Um, and I really like Sick of the Sad Days. Um, I, there's definitely, I, I have so many questions about the type of music that you create. But man, as I said, absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I appreciate you having me. <laughs> short, and, short and sweet. Um yeah, how does it feel to to drop a project? I noticed that you dropped a project every year, um, but you know, for for twenty twenty two, is it relief when you drop a project when you're like, oh, it's done, like I can finally promo it? So this is kind of like the first uh, like album or like project I put out that uh, that feels like an actual album. Like I set out to make an album, if that makes sense. The others, it's funny you say that. Like I've dropped one a year. I, those are kind of accidents, you know. Those were more like mixtapes are like just like things i would make normally like in a week or like we'd go to the mountains and like get an airbnb and just like see what we make and then release it um so kind of we were talking before the show i feel like i've always been like kind of finding my sound and i think this one was like i went through one of the toughest things i've gone through in my life at the beginning of the year um and then it was just like out of this this feeling of like pain like creating again and it felt like oh shit like this is like what it felt like when i was a kid like this is why i started you know and so like through my journey, I feel like I had like this reawakening of like, oh, okay, like this is the feeling that made me kind of start. And also I feel like I'm at a place now where I have stuff to say and like actually like I'm good at my craft and like really want to put it all in one like concise place for people where they find me, whether it's from my freestyles or from, you know, older projects or older singles or whatever it is, like something I can kind of point people towards and be like, yo, this is kind of like me trying to put the pieces together of like, this is like the first one, you know? So that's, it's, it's weird. Like people feel like, oh, you've been dropping projects and this and that. And like, for me, it's like, oh, it's kind of the first one. And even with that, it wasn't like I set out to do an album even, right? Like I, I would just make at the beginning of this year, I was like, I went through that thing. And then like, it, it, it got to the point where I probably made like a hundred songs. And then like, of those, I found like this like common thread sonically through them and like, really learned like what I wanted to be creating. Um, even lyrically, like I learned like a lot of, you know, like a lot of what I want to be doing is storytelling. And just, I, I think I figured out a better way to do that for the, the types of stories I'm trying to tell. Um, and I'm really excited, like this one's cool to me, but I'm really excited for like, to keep, keep it going, keep the momentum going of like what I made and like what I've discovered through this project and like, you guys can see like what happens next. That's what I think I'm the most hyped for. So it, it, it's a great feeling. It's a relief. But like I said, like it wasn't really like I'm going to make an album. It was like I had all these songs. I kind of found this like common thread, picked my favorites and then like tried to build this place of like, yo, it could represent this period of time and like this place of like me finding myself sonically. But also, you know, it was it's kind of scattered at the same time. So it's cool. It's cool to you. Or it's cool to hear that like it does feel like that. Yeah, it definitely feels like it's a cohesive piece of work. I'm not like, yeah. oh, this is a mash of random shit that you've been working on for the past 12 months. So yeah. uh, that's definitely not at all. Uh, there's definitely a common thread. But, you know, you said you found the feeling that you had when you started. What's that feeling? Like, what was, if like, were you searching for a feeling or d did it just happen? Uh, when, like in the beginning or this time? Yeah, in the beginning. Uh, hmm. no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. And I think that's what found me again was I wasn't looking around at anything. Like I was just like throwing paint at the wall and like, I didn't have any, I didn't have any external voices, good or right or wrong. You know, like, I think there's good external voices and inspirations we can take in like energies, whether it's like the people who relate with the music. Like, I think it's good to hear their stories and like hear how, you know, how it impacted them and then take that back. And like, you know, I think I think there's good energies, but then at the end of the day, like I think you need to have the ability to kind of turn it all off and be like, all right, what do I want to say? What do I want to create? And like, I didn't realize how hard that was going to be to do subconsciously. Like, I'm always I've been very like headstrong of like like creatively. Like, luckily, I have different outlets. Like, music's not the only thing I do. Like, before I was doing music full time, I was making clothes, and then like I like making movies or like dirt, like I like film, you know. And I eventually want to make movies, and then. Like there's other, I like painting, like there's other things creatively that kind of let me do that. But 
all that to say music is like when it became a job, you know, like when it became the thing that like, oh, it's like I do this. It, it's, it was somewhere along the way. I think I fig I subconsciously lost that feeling I had when I was a kid of like, oh, no, like you, you can always just do whatever you want. And you can always just like take a step back and be like, I'm just I'm just going to I'm going to try this and nobody even has to know about it. I think that was the biggest one was like understanding like nobody I can make whatever I want and nobody ever even has to know I, I, like that I made it. Um, and that was a really cool feeling of like just being in my room making a bunch of songs again. It was like when I was in high school, first starting to make music or even middle school, like when I would just write raps and like no one knew I made music. It had that sense to it where it was like I knew what I was creating. I knew I was creating this moment, and like the album that just dropped and everything you're about to see. But like no one else knew. And it was like that. It was I don't know. It was like that. It kind of gave me that confidence back of like I could forever just do that, especially with like all the growth I had. It got me really excited because I was like, damn, now I feel I dude. I had all the confidence in the world when I was a kid, unrightfully. You know what I mean? And like I wasn't even that guy uh, and like I wasn't that talented and I hadn't grown into that person like mentally or like creatively and like anyway it was like kind of that coupled with I had gone through that and I did feel that like actual sense of confidence and like rightfully so and then it was that coupled with that feeling of like oh I'm a kid and I can just throw paint at the wall and see what happens it's really interesting that you had a period where you lost that well because I I also think that there is this amazing freedom to the feeling of not being judged that like I can just do random shit and I can find my own pathway without other people's opinion until I'm ready. And then when I'm ready, that's like when I can give them the the voice to be like, hey, what do you think? Yeah, it's weird too because it wasn't like a judge. It did, I didn't feel like it was coming from a I would be judged place. I don't even really know what to call it. I think it was more just like the anxieties of like being a creative full time. You know, like making decisions, it was probably like decisions fatigue, to be honest. Like it was all of these things that it wasn't even that like, like, you know, when you go to set, you go to start a new project or anything, right? Like you just start something fresh and it has that feeling of it being new. And because of that, like you have all the joy and like hustle in the world, right? But then like week two, three, four, five come along and you're like, oh, now you're in the grind and you're in the repetition of the thing. And you don't even realize that you've kind of lost that initial spark feeling. So it was more of a feeling and it wasn't like, oh, I'm being judged. It was more of just like, this has become repetitive, right? And I hadn't really zoomed out and understood like, oh, I'm in momentum. Like, oh, people are fucking with what I'm doing. Like, oh, this is what that means. Like I, I did a tour with like my band and like I met a kid in person who literally came for our band show. And, but he like, after the show was like, yo, bro, like, I like I fuck with your song and like I like he mentioned the song and he was like this song saved my life and it was like it's like that feeling like I've got messages like that but it's like taking that and like seeing it in real life even and understanding like oh shit all those other messages were real and then it's at a period of time where I wasn't even like in momentum creatively like that right so it was kind of this weird like it was this weird feeling where I could like step back and zoom out and be like oh shit, this is what everything I was doing actually meant and led to. And like, it was real, you know, it, it had validity, right? Like, and and then like that letting me, it's, it's weird that like that gave me the freedom to kind of to then feel like, okay, cool, whatever, you know, whatever I make freely now moving forward. It basically gave me the feeling of like, I, I just have to trust that feeling I had when I was a kid when like everybody was like, this is crazy, you shouldn't do this. And just like trust it again. And like, I can forever kind of trust it and like really lean into it. And because of that, create more freely, if that makes sense at all. Yeah. I think it's the, the feeling of, of risk. There's, there's something about it of, Hey, let me leap. Let me take, let's stretch myself again. Let's do something that no one's expecting. Let's, let's just do stuff. Let's just see where I can go. I think the evolution of an artist, it was weird when I was, Younger, I used to believe that I'll oh, just do the same shit that I always loved because I would get annoyed. Artists would develop and then I'm like, they're just doing a different yeah. sound and now I'm no longer a fan. But now as I get older, I'm like, you should be doing that. That is healthy as an artist. And now I'm annoyed if one artist sounds the same for like back to back to back to back projects. I'm like, I heard this shit years ago. Do something new. That's, I think that's the feeling I'm talking about. It's, it's finding my balancing point within that. It's recognizing, like I said, there was like a string of this feeling 
that I recognized. And for me, it was kind of like sonically, it's like these beautiful like samples that like touch a side of your soul that like you really don't have access to. It's like this, it's like vulnerable, but beautiful, but like painful at the same time. That's how I describe it. And it's like, so I, I would hear them sonically, uh, or I, like that was the feeling sonically like i i found as like the string between them all yet there's like a million ways i can create within that right so it was kind of finding my balancing point within that of like yeah like let me keep exploring and let me take all these things i've done because like if you look at my catalog or anything i've done like i've been all over the map right and i love to just like try shit but i have been i was trying everything where now i understood like it was kind of like in a world of infinity for me creatively I wanted to like really hone in and be like, let me choose something to be great at. And that's kind of what I think this album was. It was me recognizing like, there's a lot of different pockets and styles and I'm allowed to try them. But if I really want to be great at something, I got to kind of come in and put my head down and really be, you know, like, I'm not just going to accidentally be great. You know, I'm not going to accidentally fall. Like, I believe in my, I believe in my like creative ability and myself to like make something great. But like, I don't, you have to be intentional, you know, when you really want to take it to that next place. And so that's what it was for me. Well, I think in a weird way, it's like you find your lane, but then all of a sudden it feels narrow. But once you hit a level of competency and confidence, it actually broadens again because you start to realize all the shit that you can do in that lane. And it just becomes this massive world of, Oh, even in this little yeah. pocket, I have this spectrum. Yeah, it's funny. So, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I was the uh, like paintings and like just painting in general. And that's one of the biggest things that kind of got me through this. Like last thing I went through was like I was I was just really down and like not doing shit, wasn't leaving the crib. And then I was like, all right, let me like I, I, I don't even know why, but I just started like drawing and shit and like painting. And like I, I recognized like there's this like character I draw over and over. And with that character, like I'll sketch, I have sketchbooks and like, I'll, I'll draw the same character over and over, but I'll draw them in like different scenarios. So like whatever page it's on, like I have to draw the same thing, but like, I'll do it in a different way. So like, I got a multicolor pen I use and it's like red, blue, green, and black. And like, I've got those four colors to work with. Right. So it's like, I could draw that same character in four different colors and that's four different things. Or maybe I draw them like four times or maybe 10 times, so different number of times. Maybe I just draw the head. Maybe I just draw his leg or the arm. Maybe I just draw like the stars I put around him. Maybe, but you realize like, even with that one thing, I could do a million things. And so for me in like a different, a different creative realm, it's like, it's the same thing. It's like, I've given myself almost like this framework to create within and because of that allows me to be more free because I know at the end of the day, when you zoom out, that's, that's kind of, I feel like what I'm learning. I fall in love with the most is the zoomed out view. Like when you look at an artist and you zoom out and you see the catalog and you see how the cover arts go together. Or if you look at a painter and like you zoom out and you see like all their paintings on a wall, how they go together and the development you can see. I love that. I think that's my favorite piece of all the art. It's not really the pieces themselves, although. Like, obviously I love music and I love a song or I love a painting, but like, if you zoom out and you can see that growth and you can see mistakes, but like, understand how they led to things that would have never discovered shit like that. That shit gets me so hyped. Well, I think imperfect music and imperfect art makes art. There, there's something yeah. about the fallibility that is relatable. I think it's just honest. I think you get closer to that point of honesty. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to put it. I don't know if it's that mistakes come from that place of honesty or things that have honesty tend to come from a place of mistakes, if that makes sense. But like, 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 uh, like if you think about X, uh, XXX Tentacion, like when he first started cooking up and like really blowing up, his records technically didn't sound good, right? But it's like, that's because he was recording on like a bad interface and a bad mic. And it was just like, that's what they had to work with. But yet, you could hear like you could hear the honesty in the records and like in this world of like that was like a time where everything had to be perfect and like it it just reached this point where people were sick of it and they wanted something they wanted something real and you could feel the realness in it and then that's why i think he's one of my favorites because like then when he got access to that like those resources for it to feel right it still had that sense of honesty but now it had room to grow right and that's i think i try to lean into a lot it's like fuck the tools you're working with lean into that honesty, become confident in your abilities. And no matter what setting you're in, you know, you're going to ball. Like, and I think that's what, I think that's what like a lot of the best art comes from. Now it doesn't even, it doesn't necessarily even have to come from 
uh, that place. Like you, there's great pop records, right? So you can do it. But for me, it's like my favorites um, is that place of like, just like a bad microphone. And, but, but it's like moments in time. And that's for me, that's why I try to make my music. Like it's, if there's a reason, like I hate re-recording shit. Like a lot of times, like, and I'll have like writing sessions where like, I, I, I enjoy like writing, I never really land anything because it's more just like an exercise, but it's like writing art for other artists in mind, right? Um, and it just lets me just like practice and like do other sh do other shit I wouldn't technically do for like my stuff. But within that, I'll find like, like, uh, oh damn, I lost my train of thought. Oh, fuck it. <laughs> my bad. It's what happens to me all the time. Bro, but, I hate that. <laughs> but I tell you what. It is cool. That's why I kind of love this is that this will be a moment in time oh, for you. Moment in time. Yeah. Uh, so, so what I find is like, like in those sessions, it's always like, if it's a pop writing session, for example, people will be like, yo, I love this tape, but let's try it this way. And I can do it. But if it's for like my music and they're like heartback, heartback's a great example on the album. It's my favorite hook I've ever done. And my favorite song I've ever, probably one of my favorite songs I've ever made is heartback. And on that song, there was a second verse I did. And I did it on this mic, actually. I have another mic I record most of my stuff on because the 7B is kind of trash, low key for like <laughs> what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but but you can hear like, it was either, I have like a lot of VHS TVs on, or uh, I, was, I was recording at this house I was at before with an AC and I always had to turn the AC off because otherwise you'd hear like this roaring fan. <laughs> so in the second verse, I recorded at a different moment uh, or a different time. Uh, in the second verse, you can kind of hear the AC <laughs> and it's just like technically bad. And my engineer, he, he was just like, dude, you got to re-record this. And I was like, I can't because it's like this moment of time, moment in time for me where it's like, I remember the night I was down and I wrote that and I recorded it. And it's like, that's way more important to me than like the quality. Right. But it's, you know, that's what that record is. Right. Some records demand like a technical, you know, sense about them. But like, for me, I think most of everything I do is that moment in time and that feeling. And those are the records I love where you can really feel that moment in time. Well, I think it's difficult to access an emotion that you feel so powerfully in a particular moment. Like yeah, looking yeah. back retrospectively is not as, is not the same as if you are like, all right, I'm really in that place. So mm -hmm. I definitely understand. I mean, I would hate to re-record one of these. <laughs> it would drive yeah, me. Yeah. There is no way. Number one, we couldn't do it. It would be a completely separate conversation because yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is this not is a planned. great example, actually. Yeah. yeah, and and at the and also, I love that we get to look back on this and be like, that was a moment in time yeah. for both of us in terms of this is where we're at at the time, and yeah. especially for you, where you're like, oh, that's cool. Like in ten years, I can look back and that's who I was at the time, and I'm not even that's close to that person. That's a great example to use because like, say we say the audio or the video messed up and we had to redo it tomorrow. We could do it and to everybody else, it might give them that same feeling and like give them the same experience almost, right? But to us, it would be completely different, right? But imagine we did it a year apart, then it is different. So it's like, it's weird because you can find that balancing point. So like there are some records that I will re-record, right? Because it's like, I know, like if I don't feel so closely to it where I'm like, oh, I feel this way, but it wasn't like, it wasn't so specific to that night. Like I could do it the next day. Sometimes I'll even do that, right? And it's kind of like the thing we were talking before. It's just like this pendulum, like balancing point of like taking that moment in time and really trying to be technically correct with it. Yeah, all the things that most people would never think about. Like these are the complexities of being an artist that I feel no one ever considers before they actually become an artist and throw their hat in the ring oh, yeah. and they're like, oh yeah. shit, this is really different. Yeah, I think uh, for me, for me, it's uh, I have this concept called creative life cycle. And it's like your creative life cycle is like idea to reality. So in my world, like the one I practice the most is a song. Right. And for me, my creative life cycle is the idea for the song, whether it's the lyric, the lyrics, the beat, et cetera, all the way to that moment. Somebody puts their headphones in and presses play for the first time. So there's all these like micro steps within all that of like, um like coming up with the melody, writing the lyrics, like what are you writing it on? Your notes, physically writing it down, right? There's all these decisions you have to make along the way. And like when you first get started and you think like, oh, making music would be fun. It's like, you don't think of a single one of those, right? But now I understand all of them to like their smallest intricacy. And 
I think the more you complete creative life cycle lap, so the more I have an idea for a song and then I get it out. And for me, it's like headphones in, pressing play, right? The more I complete those laps, the more I grow and the more all those little micro moments feel like second nature. And that again, like kind of lets me create more freely in whatever I do. So that's why, that's why I like painting so much. I think that's why I like all these other things because they let me just try over and over and over and over and I learn and it becomes second nature. So like now where it's like, Dude, if I wanted to, if I, if I, it's just freedom creatively where like, if I'm walking down the street and I see something and it gives me an idea for a song, I know I have it within me to like go home, write it, get the beat, record it, right? Make the beat, whatever it's gonna be. And then like, get it mixed, get it mastered, make a cover art, go to a distro company, upload my song. And then in a, like a, within a day, if I have to, it's like in somebody's headphones and they can press play because I can go on like social media or whatever and like send it to my people right? That can find it now. So it's like all those things that used to be like the end of the world to me trying to figure out, like banging my head in the wall, like how the fuck do I do that? Like all the steps, right? Like why did TuneCore not accept this? Oh, it's because the cover art needs X, Y, and Z. Like these are the dimensions or oh, because like my mix was in the wrong, all the bullshit, right? Where now it kind of feels second nature where it's like, I can just play and I can just create freely. And it's, I think for all of us in everything we do, podcasting, great example. I'm sure there's shit that just feels like second nature. I'm sure your setup time today compared to the first time you ever did one was way different. I'm sure your day felt different. I'm sure the feeling right now, you're probably less stressed, all that shit, right? So it's like, to me, that's creative life cycle. And the more laps you complete, the better and the more access you have to that feeling that lets you then go do it at a higher level. Well, I was thinking about it literally yesterday. I was like, oh, I'll just pop up my next project i'll put up put it in and when when i first started i was like how the fuck do i release anything oh, like dude. you yeah. need like rss feeds and you need distribution to everything you need to have like bios everything recorded edited uh you need like you just need it all and now like i've done it so many times like you said it's yep. i don't even think about like i just got to get it done and i'm not stressed about get i'm not stressed about how i'm getting it done it's only about getting it done and same with interviews I remember yeah. my first interview and let me tell you, it was an absolute fucking horror show. It was yeah. a shit show. I was so bad. Um, but, you know, we've done over 100 episodes since and, yeah, I feel so comfortable flying unguided that, yeah, the, it, I, I love the creative process of let's find out the weird shit that no one gets to ask about purely because it's the nature of having a normal conversation. For sure. It also lets you move the needle on what you want to do creatively. So like for me, creative life cycle is that idea for a song into headphones. But like now that alone makes me like feel bored. So like now my creative life cycle, I feel like I'm working on the most is like shows. So it's why I'm like, that's why I threw the release party. It's why I threw a show like the day after. It's why like, I'm, my North Star right now is touring because like I want I want to chase that feeling of like, let me think of a city to play it in. Let me think of the songs. Let me release the songs. Let me ex move the needle of that creative life cycle, right? Let me, rather than the idea for the song and then it's in the headphones, why not idea for a song and then I play it at a show, right? Because I think I feel my impact more that way and I can actually get my message across and like, you know, that it lets you move. And I'm sure there'll be a point where I'm bored with that. And I want to, you know, and it, but it let, that's your growth and it lets you keep moving your needle creatively forward. Um, but yeah, like, I, I think the best way is just completing those laps and be intentional with like what those laps look like, you know, otherwise like you, you don't stick with anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think it just goes back to becoming an expert and becoming comfortable with your version of what the creativity looks like. And something I wanted yeah, to ask sure. you about was there is pain and there is sadness in your music. And I, I wonder where that comes from. The, the I've always like you mentioned Triple uh, X Tentacion and I've, I wondered where the pain comes from because accessing it it, it, it doesn't feel manufactured. It feels real. And so it's always intrigued me people who create heartfelt music music that makes you feel sadness as opposed to other emotions how that's accessed and what drives that force uh again i think it's kind of just like an honest approach to creativity like 
like I said, like that feeling I had when I was a kid, it was because I felt like this, this sense of like, um, this sense of like, at first probably even anger of like, I understand what I want to be doing, but like everybody in my life that gets to tell me what I need to do is telling me I can't. And it was like, to me, that was so like unrealistic. It was like a bad way to look at things. And it just like, as it happened more and more, it just made me angry, you know? And then like through growth, I understood like it was re realistic and like these people just wanted to help me, right? And they couldn't understand that like this kid who was like 12, 13, knew he wanted to be a rapper. It's like, bro, that's ridiculous, right? Like it takes a level of ridiculousness, right? But it's like, for me, it was just simple. It was like, I love to do this thing and like I'm down to work hard at it. So like, let's go, like, let me get started. And like for other people, it's like, it just doesn't match with like the timeline of a regular like existence. It's like, yo, you need to like, you'll figure out what you want to do and like have tried enough things by the time you're like 22, 23 to then make a, you know, make a decision of something you want to really try. And then from 23 to 30, like, that's just a normal path, which to me is just, was just bullshit. It was just like, bro, I just, I know what I want to do. I love it. I've tried, I was always just doing shit. So I was always trying things, seeing what I liked, seeing what I didn't. And then like from there, like recognize what I really want to do. And then from that place of like, oh, you can't. And then like being like to the point where it's like, bro, like I don't even like, I know what I want to do and you're telling me I can't. And to the point where it was just, uh, I, I think that's that's kind of where my why even stems from that and a lot of other things um, like my, my brother has autism and it was kind of like growing up, like seeing him being told not being told no, but like what society tells you no to like uh, there was this time we were all at like uh, we were at like a big church for like an Easter service or something and uh, it was like a thousand people there, right? And like they're playing music, and then my brother like ran on stage, right? And he like he's like jumping around on stage, and the whole church is losing their minds, and like, yo, what, what's going on? And then like they get him and they bring him off, and it's just like, or being in a restaurant and like it's supposed to be quiet, and you're eating, and like he gets up and starts yelling and dancing, right? And like seeing that over and over, where like realizing it's not the end of the world and it's not really a big deal but we make it out to be a big deal so all those things i think inform my why which is like don't let anybody tell you what you can or can't do and like from there it was like i wanted to just like have that impact at scale because it was like taking that feeling and that pain i had as a kid of like you can't do this and then like flipping it and being like nah it's just like genuine passion and if you believe in it really just go for it because like it's unrealistic to not to because you're not going to lead a life of fulfillment otherwise and i think that'll lead to a lot of other solutions um, and then that turned into like trying to empower creatives because I feel like I have access to like one perspective of what that means. Like, don't let anybody tell you what you can or can't do. And like, I can be proof to some people, but like, I don't have access to a lot of perspectives that like also need to be heard and like voices that need to be heard with like other conflicts that I can't even begin to comprehend. You know what I mean? So a long answer to, I think that's where the pain originated was being told what I could or couldn't do. And I think that's what informed my why. And then as I, as I grew, then it's just lived experience, you know, of once you decide what you want to do, that's great. That's step one. And that's the hardest thing. Like the greatest gift in life is a passion. But like, once you find that, that's, that just allows you to play the game. And then you start the game and like along the way, you're going to, there's a lot more pain, you know? Um, so I think it's lived experience. And because I've kind of set out so early and understood like, now nah, this is what I want to do. And I really am going to try at something. And I know what that thing is. And like, if I, if I, you know, fall down, I have to get back up. Like you're going to have to get knocked down a lot. So it's just like an honest place. I, my music was always that, that place. Like you talking about when I was a kid, it was just that place I could go to like write down how I was feeling and really like, it was, that's what it was. It was like almost like a sense of therapy for me. I'm terrible. It's wild. Cause like, I'm terrible at talking about how I feel with people or like terrible, but like, it was just this place I could go and be like, I'm, this is just, I'm going to be me fully and like really like talk about it or like take the way I'm feeling and flip it, you know, and like put it into this like thing I like to create. So I think that's where it came from or like why, why it results in like some of the, some painful songs. And like, I was, it's why you actually asked that. Cause I had this thought the other day. It was like, I recognize that even myself. And I'm like, I don't really want it to have that feeling forever. Obviously, obviously. Right. Like I don't want to feel like I'm, I, I have to make these songs even. Right. Like I was really starting to think about that. Like, damn, like my catalog is kind of like that, right? And it's like, it's weird too. Cause like, if you meet me, it's like, that's not even how I am as a person. Like I'm very like, 
I, I don't know, like I can't sit still and like I like to run around and do shit and like go have fun, climb tall, I like explore, I love nature, like shit like that. But yeah, like that is how it comes out. So uh, I forget the thought I ended up having with it. But I, anyway, I was thinking about that the other day. Yeah, it is funny that you get asked the question you've been thinking about for a while. Yeah. 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 And I always, I mean, I feel like it, it happens, but it's funny that, you know, because I was thinking and th- th- while you were speaking, I realized like you said anger was the first emotion and I feel and ca- I cannot explain this more. I had this conversation literally yesterday. I hate being told what to do. Yeah. I hate when someone says you have to do this or you can't do this because my yeah. natural reaction is go fuck yourself. I'm going to do it my <laughs> way and I'm going to yeah. show you that I can do it. And there's something about the negativity that's, that is empowering to me because it yeah. motivates me to show you that I can do better. But in the weirdest way, you having the start as anger and then you having the thought of, I don't want to make this type of music forever. And this album yeah. being titled hath no fury yeah. is subconsciously the journey of that. The, I think that, so for me, hath no fury was, it was, it was this moment of pain and like ha, it comes from hell hath no fury. Right. It's like, hell can't even compare to this way I'm feeling basically, right? Like has no fury, like the way I'm feeling, right? But there's a, it was like taking that feeling and then like being like, I'm going to flip it. And then it's kind of like hell hath no fury, like me and like what I'm about to do and like the impact I'm about to have and like the result of that kind of like we were saying, it's a good motivator, you know? And so I felt like the album kind of represented that like, oh shit, like this project and this thing, that's kind of what it is. It's hell hath no, it hath no fury like this. Right. And like the impact and what this is going to kind of become. So, yeah, it is weird that it stems from that. I think for me, it came from this place of like, I would do, I was just listening to a lot of Eminem early. So like probably <laughs> comes from like my influences. And I think that it got more channeled, like probably my two biggest like influence, maybe three would be like Eminem, uh, uh, Kanye, and then like, who Travis Scott like those were probably like the ones that informed like my feeling and it's like M was always angry Travis Scott you go to a show and it's just rage right and it's like that's what it is but it's like the best live show you'll ever go to like but especially oh man like some of the best shows I've seen were early Travis Scott shows and then Kanye I haven't even seen a show I can't even imagine that shit was probably crazy but but then it was like I had other influences like j cole was probably just as big mac miller was def like probably the biggest uh you know tendrick right these like a lot of lyricists right and then it was just like i think people who were being introspective and then it was like almost like i guess people who were just thinking and talking about it and having an open conversation and that was always interesting to me i think like being that kid who was like, I know what I want to do. And people were like, no, you don't. Me being like, me knowing, like, I for sure do, right? And it's like then taking that and doing something about that. And then like the growth that comes with that. And then like wanting places to go to talk about it. But like my peers or like people my age or like even people, most people older than me, I can't really have a conversation that like is on that level, if that makes sense. Like most people don't take that leap ever. So it's like, being a kid and knowing it and then doing something about it and then like now still trying to grow and looking up but like kind of looking around like I I seek that conversation constantly and I think that's where my music will go it'll kind of be those like conversations I wish I could be having that like maybe I don't always get to have or have access to I wonder what it is about us having dreams and then society (laughs) or the world we live in trying to blunt those dreams I think it's just lived experience. Like I said, that's why I think I want to empower creatives so much is because I think there's perspectives we probably don't have access to that like are genuine. Like for me, I, I, I could say like, oh, nothing, like don't let anything stop you. Like you, you become your reality, right? But like, how am I going to tell that to a kid overseas who has absolutely nothing and like doesn't have a father and like does it like his situation is like 20 times as worse as mine ever got when I was like homeless sleeping in my car. Right. It's like that we're not having a, like, I can't, I can't give that person access to my, you know, my experience and be like, pick yourself up, do it yourself because I don't understand that perspective, but there are people who do. So that's why I want to like empower that feeling. Um, But I think still like, I think life just beats you down, bro. Like I think people, 
there's a Tupac quote that he's always talking about, like, by the time you get, you know, 24, like, they've almost, like, beat it out of you, like, that will and that drive. And I think the way everything's kind of set up is for you to really just shut up and listen until you're, like, 18, and then you have, like, two to four years of, like, a chance. And, like, that's your first two, that's your first years of freedom. Like, most people aren't going to take that first two to, first 10 years of that freedom after their whole lives you've been told what to do and then it's like all of a sudden i'm gonna just take that and be like let me like let me work hard it's like you're gonna explore and then by the time you're done exploring it's almost too late which is why i really want to empower people to be like don't let people tell you what you can or can't do early because then you have that time to explore and it's needed and that creativity and then that can lead to actual like you actually have the drive to still do something about it you know so and I think I think it's a spectrum. So like people, maybe people like us, it's like you could go till you're 40 and you'll always have that drive, right? But it's like very rare. And I think that's why it's good. You do stuff like the podcast is fucking awesome. That's why, you know, shit like this is really cool to me. Well, it's it's interesting because I, I agree with you. I was reflecting and I was like, oh, by the time you finish school and by the time you move out, you've got bills to pay. The the invisible handcuffs are there. Yeah. Like oh, you, you have those bills, like, and all of a sudden you've got you know, <laughs> college debt, university debt. Then you've got the weight of relationships you might have. And then yeah. all of a sudden you have kids or you get married and all the th- risks and all the chances you want to take. And now they all have caveats based on your responsibilities. It's and all amplified. It, 100%. And, you know, I only started this podcast when I was, I think I was, Two 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 and a half years ago, so that's when I was 26. So that's pretty late for like when we're talking about, but I was fortunate I did drama and I did creative things in high school. And so I always knew I had that in me and it was, it was figuring out where the creative process actually is yeah. rather than like, and I think it was blunted when I started full-time work, I did nothing creative. Because yeah, it was yeah. taking all my time and energy, and then Absolutely, I started, yeah. and then it's I realized I wasn't happy. Oh, it's huge risk, but it's worth yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why that's yeah, one hundred percent. It's it leads to it's a fulfillment pathway worth having. You know, what I mean, like it's almost like at its core, it has like this like biological feeling of like I'm gonna try to do something, and then I accomplish it, and then I get to move the needle and do it again, and that's what it's all about is that journey. And that's what we're all doing along the way of like all these other things, but we're kind of like tricking ourselves into like these short-term loops that don't lead to that long-term fulfillment because you can't move the needle, you know? So it's just about understanding, I think that and like zooming out, you know, I think zooming out helps a lot. And in the weirdest way, this is more work than anything else. But yeah. It's better than anything else. Like, yeah, yeah. it's, it's the weirdest, like, when I talk about it and the amount of effort that people like you artists have to go through, I'm like, you'd almost have to be insane to sign up for that. It's not work though. It's play. Right. And I think if you could, that's why it creates fulfillment pathways. There's like things I've set out to do in my life where it's like, it felt like work, you know, it felt like a job and it's like, I you're never going to compete with like, the person where it's like, it doesn't feel like that. Like, that's why I'm, I think that's where a lot of my confidence comes from too. And it's also like not really competition either, but like, I guess if you zoom out even more, it probably is like, for instance, like people, people view, like maybe there can only be so many, uh, like there's a real shift happening right now, for instance, right? Like where there's like a, for the first time ever, there's like a middle class of artists, right? Like I'd consider myself like a middle class artist, right? Like. I'm not rich and famous, but like I can survive and like fulfill myself creatively and I'm, I can grow it. Right. And it's like, that's never really existed. You've always like needed something to happen. Um, and within that, I think there's this sense of like, there can only be a few of us, right. Because if somebody else comes in then there's no more, but I think that's a bad way to look at it. Even I think as you zoom out, like we're not really competing with each other. I think we're competing with like, uh, I think we're competing with, it's just the tension overall. So, and I think, or, or like products, like, I think we're competing. Like I look at it, like I'm competing with Coca-Cola where it's like, I think eventually what's going to happen is there's going to be this tipping point where like music kind of goes down. Like you're not really making as much money off music, probably nothing yet. You're going to be, because of that, you're going to be able to sell like products and like people are going to rock with you. And like, 
rather than like buying a shirt from, you know, Nike, like they'd rather buy a shirt from Drex because it's like, if I can, you know, if I can give them that quality and then like give them something it stands for, right. Then like, they're going to buy it from me. And I think no one's really doing that at scale right now. So that's where the competition comes into me. I think I'm not, I'm not going after the lunch of like my fellow artists. It's almost like eventually down the road, I'm going after the lunch of these Nikes and Coca-Cola and like things like that. And to me, it's like, they really can't compete because to them it's a job. And to me, I'm just having fun. And because of it, like people are going to see that and then it builds and then be, it's, a, it's just a cycle, you know? So I think, and I think because of that, it, it you're going to see this massive shift in like society because of that, because it is play. And because that is kind of what you're seeing with YouTubers. I think they're going to be the first because they have like the most access to like really building communities, you know? And, uh, like at scale, scale, like it's hard for a musician to have like a weekly conversation with their audience. Right. But like these YouTubers are able to do it every day. Right. So like the Mr. Beast of the world or whoever, like every, every fucking day they're going out there and they're just talking to their audience and building this relationship. And then because of that, they can sell them everything from chocolate bars to hamburgers now, where it's like, if you told somebody that, you know, five years ago, they'd say, that's ridiculous. Like, I'm not going to buy my fast food from a YouTuber where I think just as ridiculous as that sounds is what it's going to be like in music. I think, you know, you're going to be like, I'm not buying my soda from a rapper where it's like, why not? You know? <laughs> Good point. Literally. Why not? Yeah. Um, yeah. But pod- that's how podcasts make most successful podcasts, make their money off their own. It's you garner an audience through free yeah. content and then the audience wants to continue to support you and they like what you do. So they purchase the products that you make because they're fans of the work that you do. And it's interesting because I think on a musical side, it, 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 I, I also agree. I don't think you're competing with your contemporaries in the, the people in the so-called middle class. I actually think who you're competing against (laughs) is big money studios. I think there is this, competition that's happening right now and I I can kind of feel it when I speak to different artists is there's this growing feeling that big studios are not what's good for music and so fans are moving to artists who are independent and can create from a place that is honest raw and real and not muddied by the true waters of making huge cash I don't think they're doing that consciously though. I think it's just because it's the result is the product is better. Like what we were talking, the honesty shows and because of that, more people are drawn to them. And so because of that, I think that's why you're seeing the needle move there. And then you're going to see the mass shifts of industries kind of move there, you know? But I mean, even with that, to me, the music industry isn't a big industry. Like it's big as far as eyes. Monetarily, it's not that big. You know, if you look at like, like Netflix, for example, or like Amazon, like those are industries. Amazon does more in a month than the whole music, recorded music industry does in like a whole year, right? Shout out Circa Entrepreneur. <laughs> he taught me that one. <laughs> but, he was, but it's like, he made me see, it's like, it's 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 a small industry, you know what I mean? And uh, because of that, I think that's where my feeling towards like, bro, we're going to be selling merch. We're going to be selling create like things that we enjoy creatively to our people um if we're gonna survive you know and like i think that's what it's been it's like dude i would never release like like i don't think i don't think 99 percent of artists who sell t-shirts are actually infatuated with selling t-shirts i like selling t-shirts i like clothes i like fabrics i like painting i like but like i don't think everybody has that same creative draw but like i bet you There's artists out there who love coffee, right? But they don't sell coffee, but they'd rather sell coffee than a t-shirt because they actually love it. And you're going to see, you're going to see somebody do it and somebody else and somebody else. And it's going to be this domino effect of like, well, why not me? Right. That's all it's going to take. And so I don't really know how it works out, but I think like you're saying that honesty is going to, is just going to, there's more attention going to be garnered toward that. Industries are going to kind of shift towards that. And then because of that, they're going to monetize it differently. Yeah. I think in the weirdest way, even still, we haven't figured out how to monetize uh, music properly because the the movie industry, they figured out how to monetize movies. 
that's why there's so much money pumped into them. So, and because there's, it's so easy these days to create music and put your music out there that I think it's still like, there is a huge barrier to entry when it comes to creating movies. I mean, you said to, I mean, you filmed, I saw, you know, you have, um, Oh, Moonlight Madness, like the, the short, that's, the, that's the one of my short, favorite things we've done. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. But you have got Moonlight Madness, and it's like twenty four minutes. But yeah. the the time it would have taken to film all of that yeah. is not the same. And then distribute, and you know, we're talking about you know the quality of cameras you need to get, the time it takes to editing, like the barrier yeah. to entry to creating a film, especially now you need characters, you need actors, you need and again, I'm talking about a normal film. You could do a solo project where you do it yeah, all by yourself and it's not that big, sure. but there's a huge barrier there for most independents to even consider something like that. And I can't yeah. trust that to music. It's not <clears throat> the same in terms of, as you said, you can just do it on ship, Mike, and this still yeah, feels yeah. great. Yeah. I think it'll just take time. I was actually having a conversation with somebody who does like, uh, they basically manage projects. So they were working on the new Knives Out. Uh, and like their job is like basically getting everybody in the same place. Right. And I was just asking every question I could, I was like, yo, how does the industry work? And they broke it down where it was like, it, I, it like, I was like, all right, if I want to make a movie today, right. And I want to release it and then monetize it. How do I do that? Like for me, it's like a song and I understand how you technically can, like whether it's streams or you sell CDs or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I just want to know the ways. And to them, it didn't even, it wasn't even a concept to like go do that independently. Cause they were like, you, you just can't. Right. They were like, you would take it and sell it to like, you like, you'd get up. You, like, they were like, you wouldn't even make the movie before we had the budget. And I was like, all right, but what if you had the money, right? Like, let's take away that barrier. And then like, all right, cool. Then we'd make the whole movie and we figured all that out. And they, they were like, uh, I was like, okay, then what? And they were like, you would take it and shop it at film festivals. And I'm like, why do you got to sell it to, <laughs> like, like to sell it to a studio? And then they were like, well, they wouldn't, the studios wouldn't even buy it because it's already made and they're going to make their money because they're putting money up. And I'm like, that's a bad business model. Because like, all these and that's what everything is all these industries are built on loans right so they're built on like they're built on money just being handed out and it's like it's just it's it it can make sense and it's like good business for like non-entrepreneurial people but like people with their head on their shoulders that are really trying to create something as at a, at a business scale as well is like if you just think of like yo who are you actually selling it to we finally got there where it's like they're making their money off like the pay for views like like i go on amazon and pay ten dollars to rent the movie right that's how they're making their money or it's why if you see an independent film more likely than not they're doing that or you get like a deal with netflix right so it's like that's where the money's really made and then advertising and then like overseas is like a really big game so like for them they were saying like yeah overseas is like you can make a lot of money there so that's where the real money is made right but if you if you zoom out and you talk to all the players in the game or all the people who would actually want to even do it independently or could, because like this person could do it independently and they want to, like we had convos about them wanting to direct and like do all this stuff and do it themselves. And they have the team and they know all the people and the pieces and they have that, they could get access to the capital even. And it's like, even knowing all that, it's not even a concept. Right. So it's like, I think it just takes time and it takes people to really step up and be like, I'm going to be the first. I'm going to try it. And that's what you saw in music. That's why you're seeing the rest of the world win. And you're going to start seeing these people more and more like coming up and like they're fully independent. It's why Bad Bunny is Bad Bunny. Like if you look at Bad Bunny's business model, it's crazy, right? And you're going to, it just takes people like that to like really do it. And then you can, you can recognize like, oh, maybe I could do that. And then the me's of the world do it, right? And then the next generation, they see they can do it. And so, um, was I, I think with that, it's it's kind of the same in every industry, but every industry is going to have like a, a different time table, right? Film, way harder to do. Like I can't just get a computer and a mic and an interface and a TuneCore account and go make a movie, right? It's a lot of moving parts to make it, to make it great. You know, I can make a great song with just that, um, but to make a great film, like it needs a lot. So, but anyway, I think every industry kind of goes that route eventually because it's like, that's what, every industry went in general and then what's just going to happen is a new industry is going to be built around it you know like uh 
mo- movies, for instance, movies are just gonna become not the thing, you know? Like think about the radio industry. It's like, we're not even, we wouldn't even talk about that anymore because it's like, what are we talking about? Who listens to the radio, right? It's gonna be like that with movies. Who knows, maybe, maybe it's like that with music in the way we consume it, right? Not music, music stood the test of time, but like maybe one day the idea of streaming a song is like, what does that mean? Because three years ago, it was, what does that mean? <laughs> and then like, it was CDs or like iTunes buys. It's gonna just be something different. You're gonna put your VR headset on and some shit, right? <laughs> you know? So, uh, Can I, I just think, say, I think, yeah, my that, bad, my bad. I'm like, nah, it's it's all, it's all good, but it reminded me because I'm fascinated by comedians as well, and in oh, the weirdest yeah. way, comedians are the f- almost the first who started to do it. I've noticed a huge trend. They were obsessed with getting deals on yeah. um, oh, no, Comedy no. Central. That was they were like oh, trying yeah. to get deals on Comedy Central, uh, HBO. Yeah. Then Netflix came out. They started getting deals on. Netflix, and now you're seeing a lot of great comedians simply put up their own money, film yep. their own special, obviously go yep. on their own tours, but also they're just putting it out on YouTube. So they're like, I'm going to invest 100000 picking a random number. I'm going to invest 100000 of my own cash. It's not a loan. It's just what I'm investing. And I'm going to try and make that back plus some purely by putting it on YouTube and then the yep. the ad revenue you get is all you. It's not a partnership. You don't yeah. owe anyone. It's purely your own. And I think you're 100% right that this is a way that other industries are going to follow. They're going to try and cut out the middleman in the sense there's they just a, need a place to put the music. There's a million examples of all of it. You know, like and, Andrew Schultz is another one in the comedy world that just that, right? And like... He he made his own platform that you could buy the special on, right? There's a million ways you can do it. At the end of the day, they all have a common thread. And the thread is a great product, like a great song, a great comedy special, a great movie. The piece of art has to be great, right? And then it takes the audience, the people who connect with it. Everything else is bullshit. And I think for me, like, underst- once I understood that one was when I was able to just, like, unlock that feeling again of, like, all that matters is I create and cook up a great product that i'm hyped with and i i get a feeling from because that feeling i had when i was a kid who like knew it was special was right and like if i do it again and again and again and again i'm gonna keep having access to that feeling and the more i do that i know other people are gonna rock with it and then i just gotta find them everything else will just figure itself out i can make bad moves i can make bad business deals i could do i could do everything wrong and it, I'll still be going forward because I made a great thing and people rocked with it. So I think like, and that's the answer nobody wants to hear because it's bullshit. Like the ki- like when I was coming up, if you told me that, I'd be like, "Fuck you! How do I get on playlists?" You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'd be like, "How? The how is so important." But like as I've gone over, like as I keep kind of progressing and access to new levels, it's like I think that why is just everything. The why and like the product and the people, the product and the people. That's it. That's all that really matters. The so same with the podcast. You you do a great podcast and you find the people, your mic doesn't matter. Your this doesn't it's just pieces of making it great. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And every day it'll get better. I like Absolutely. as as we said, it, the first track you ever released is not the same yeah. quality of the music that you put out now, but being able to go back and see the difference is the interesting part. It goes back to what we're saying, the journey of an artist and who an artist becomes on that journey is part of the reason we follow an artist as well as obviously the art that they create. But there is something amazing to watch. Oh, shit, I was a fan when it sounded like dog shit. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm a fan when it sounds amazing and I've seen and I've grown and, you know, it's accompanied me on all these journeys and the art that you create in in the weirdest way is a moment in time in their life that they yeah. listen to a song and it brings them back to, oh, that's when I was struggling or that's when I had yeah. this going on and now I get to look back. And in the weirdest way, we're this is like the first generation where we're probably going to see the true impact of a generational artist, an artist that follows yeah. someone's full life, 
especially yeah, in hip-hop. Yeah. In hip-hop, you know, the lifespan of an artist is so short, but I'm looking forward to seeing an artist who's started at 20, doesn't stop till they're like 70, and their fans have been there for like 50 years, and they can be like, all these yeah. projects accompanied me through life. Yeah, and the mistakes they make. I think that's a big one too. Like the mistakes you make as people and artists, I think that one's going to be the most interesting because especially as things get very like uh, – more eyes on you as a human and more like judgment passed, I think you're going to see like a very interesting shift in what that means, like culturally and artistically. Um, I think that'll be, it, it's going to be wild because you're going to get to see that play out and it's going to be documented for the first time. That's wild. You're seeing it right now with Kanye, you know, Kanye inspired a whole generation and like you, it's like, you can't mention his name because of like the atrocities of the things he's talking about. I, I don't who's right who's wrong who knows but like it's just interesting you know like seeing that kind of play out you know it's a it's a wild concept you got a guy who inspired a whole generation and then you're like he made a he made a fatal mistake in the eyes of the world and it's like okay what now like he doesn't go anywhere you know like like the cameras are still rolling and uh you, like you said it's a generational artist that you're gonna see it play out and like i think I think seeing those mistakes, and I think that's where a lot of like, for me, I think a lot of my biggest fears stem from is like, I really, I, I want to keep running. I, I run headfirst into like problems because they're growth, not problems, but like difficult things. Like if something feels difficult, I've grown to the point where it's like, I run after it and like, let's get through it now because otherwise I'm just wasting every, we're all wasting time. Right. So if there's something difficult, go do it. And then when you do it, you grow. But with that, I I, I I I wonder if there's like this feeling of like burnout that you get, you know, if you look at a guy like Kanye, it's like, dude, I can't imagine like the cameras. Are, that's why I hate cameras. This is why I, this is like kind of the first time I'm doing this. Like, I feel like it's the first time I've had like a head on my shoulders to like actually be able to like, you know, represent who I am. But like, that's going to change in two years. It's going to change in 10 years. And I'm going to look back and be like, oh, damn, like, was I ready for these kind of moments? And so I'm very interested to see kind of how that plays out, like how I grow as an artist and like my peers kind of grow as well as like, you know, what what are the real pitfalls of all this, you know? Yeah, I think too many eyes and too many people talking about you and too much. There is, I think there is a pitfall in creating gods out of people. And there is yeah, this yeah. this weird thing that happens and you can see it with famous people that they are they are just humans they have the same emotions that we all have yet we've idolized them and made them feel like gods but i think there is also something internal where they're like there's a part of me that i still hate and you love this you've made me feel like this idol and this amazing person with no flaws but i look my, myself in the mirror and there are times where I can't look at that person and I hate yeah. myself. And this this contradictory ego validation but also interpersonal kind of growth I think can drive a lot of them insane because it, it doesn't line with how they view themselves I think as well. I think that's a decision you make of fame versus impact. Like are you try what what why are we doing all this, right? Is it for that fame and that feeling and the access or is it for that impact, you know, and the message and the, the things the standing up for the thing you believe in. And then there's a spectrum of everything in between, but like, yeah, I saw, I saw a post today actually, and it was this artist from Orlando named Caskey and he posted it was like a long rant about fame versus impact. And it, for me, it's always been like my why instead of like the how, you know, and I think it's kind of similar. It's almost like, what are you chasing a message and like, a result of that or are you chasing self-validation you know and i i would probably say when i started like when i was like 13 14 like i was probably chasing that like self-validation because everybody else was saying you don't got it and it's like fuck you i got it but like <laughs> once i knew like when i didn't know i had it i just felt that way but then once i knew i had it like and once i knew i didn't have it and then i grew into that person who did have it i think then it was like that was that shift I started to feel of like, wait, why am I even doing this? Like, who gives a fuck if I win this game? Like, what happens then, you know? And it's like we were talking, that zoomed out approach of seeing like, what is the result of all this going to be? And that's that decision, fame versus impact. Yeah. 
do you do you know your next project in terms of because you said you had hundreds of tracks throughout the year do you know what <laughs> that's funny you asked that last night i went through and listened to them all again and uh i just was just clicking through my whole like ableton project file and i found like 10 of them that i was going to release as or i probably will release as like b-sides to the album so i, I probably cut it to like five so it's more of an ep so i'm going to do I'll probably drop that in like a week or two. I'm trying to rush. Like I got to actually finish them. So I got to be quick, but we'll see. My birthday is in like two weeks. So I want to drop it kind of on my birthday. It's like the half no fury B side. Um, and then after that, uh, I do a song a week. So I'm doing a song every week until I go on tour. Uh, no idea when I'm going on tour. So hopefully <laughs> shit picks up. <laughs> and then, uh, But I, I just, for me, it's like cre- completing those creative life cycle laps. Like a song a week for me lets me do that at the scale. Like I make more than a song a week, right? But it's like a good, let me finish it, put it out, see the result, let's keep going. So that's why I do a song a week. I do them every Tuesday at midnight. And then uh, I have another project I'm working on, working titles called Winner's End. So I probably, because I just want it to be, I wanted to drop it during the winter, but like, cause it feels like the winter, but I'll probably, probably be closer to the end of January, early February. So um, yeah, I'm working on that. I just decided to start that yesterday. Uh, same with the B side. So like two projects I decided to start yesterday, but both of those will be done within like, one of them's already done. I just got to finish them if that makes sense. Like I've already recorded them all. There's the songs I was making during Half No Fury that like, got the axe for one reason or another one was supposed to be the intro but like the like we were talking about earlier the sound quality was shit uh one uh but like it's cool like yo that's another reason i'm doing it it's wild to see like when you release songs and then like best example my least favorite song i've ever dropped some kid got a tattoo of, and it's like bro i almost took that song off spotify and it's like now it like what it meant to this person was like something I could have never expected. So you really never know the impact and you never know how other people are actually hearing what you're doing because you're hearing it way different because you're so close to it. But like, let let the ideas live, you know, like put them out, have a have a sense of like, you know, have have your artistic taste in them still and be like, if this is good or bad, you know, make judgments. But like at the end of the day, you kind of got to let more shit fly than not for the fame versus impact for the impact route i think uh but anyway so those those are the two projects and they'll, they'll be done pretty soon and then after that i have a i think uh hopefully next year sometime i want to drop a project called 2047 it was like i almost called this last project that um but then i came up with this like conceptual project idea of like in a damn i shouldn't be talking about it this early but fucking in a in a world <laughs> like uh, actually, hold on. Let me, let me. I wrote, I wrote the thesis down. Let me, let me see if I can find it in my notes. Because I would do it. I was. It's this idea I've had forever. Um, how the hell you spell thesis? Thesis. Well, I was gonna say, by the time this actually drops, there's like a six to eight week lead time on this. So, okay. The good thing is that you're gonna say it now, and by the time it comes out, all this thing is gonna be real cool. So I just get yeah, the facts, sneak peek, facts. the exclusive. So. Oh, that's so. So six weeks. Six to eight weeks. I think it depends oh, on, on the cycle. So that means by the time this drops, wow. I mean, who knows? But by the time this drops, probably both those projects will have dropped. I have dropped like five more songs. Damn, that's crazy. All right, if you're listening right now, go check all that shit out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hold on. I found the thesis. Uh, and it, the, the, by the time this comes out, the thesis and the idea will totally change. But it's we fucked up the year is 2047 and we're sending our best people into space hibernation to outlast our soon demise they won't remember a thing but they will survive what will we what will we leave them to help them relearn our newfound glory and sidestep our fatal mistake so it's basically like all knowledge is about to be lost but like we're gonna get to set like basically all right if the world ended today it, it, it started where i saw this thing where if, the world ended, like if, or not world ended, if you removed humans from the earth within, I forget what time period, something shorter than what it was, it was either a couple hundred, couple thousand years, you'd have no, you, you, could, you would have never been able to tell humans were on earth. Like everything would be eroded and eaten by the earth. And it's yeah, like, I saw oh, that video as well, actually, on, on YouTube. Really? Like, yeah. I don't even know. I think somebody said it to me. And like, I was like, nah. And I looked it up and I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? So it, I think it was like a couple hundred years or something crazy. <clears throat> and then it got me thinking. I watch like, I watch all this shit on like, uh, 
the pyramids or like ancient civilizations we're just discovering that are like, oh shit, like literally as of 10, 15 years ago, we're finding like whole villages underneath shit of like underneath trees and mountains. It's like, no, nah, there was a whole village and we can see it using like LIDAR and shit, like scanning it. And this is like new developments and like historians are like, nah, like they're very, they're very like stern to like actually accept these kind of theories as they probably should, because otherwise we'd have some wild history. But uh, anyway, it was like the ideas of like, yo, what if there was like something before us that had technology like just as great as us? And like, I always think it's fascinating. Like, what if? Like, because it's real, like it's a possibility, right? Like, what if we had crazy technology, we blew ourselves up and then it got disappeared, right? It's a realistic. So anyway, it's almost like playing with that idea. And then like, imagine you're in that scenario and then uh, imagine you're in that scenario and then like, but you know, it's about to happen. What would you leave? Like, would you make a pyramid or like, would you make some crazy shit out of stone? Cause maybe stone lasts or like, I don't know. Like, I want to learn, like maybe it's some crazy metal or diamond. I don't know. Like, what do you leave? Like, is it a tablet of like things and rules? Like, anyway, it gets mad biblical, I guess <laughs> even, but like, that that's kind of gonna i don't think it's gonna be like a conceptual project like i ain't gonna be rapping like like this crazy idea but i think it's like the the theme and it's i don't know maybe i'll do like a comic or like something cool aside and then it's gonna have that it's just gonna have that feeling in the production like i want to lean more like space and like big synths and basses but like take that sound i'm already doing and like bring it into that world and just see what happens it could be trash and maybe i don't drop it but we'll see <laughs> Well, I like the idea. I always like ideas that push boundaries. And I don't know, there's something about the potential to be like, uh, what are the things that I want to leave behind? These are the seven yeah. or eight or like 10 lessons or 10 thoughts that I want to leave behind. Or it doesn't even have to be like how you would leave it behind. It's just like, if I could, this is what I would want yeah. to leave. That's that's. Tr have you heard of the gold disc, the golden disc we sent out into space? No. Nah. Oh, uh, bro. So I forget what year it was, but we sent on one of the, we sent a rocket just out into space and we put this gold vinyl disc on the rocket and it had like every language recording, like saying hello. It had like all types of music. It had this like engraving of like how to make the device to play the disc if you found it. That would be universal if like some life out there found it. It had the exact coordinates of where we're at in the in the universe or in our galaxy. It had like the exact like, it's like basically these like series of lines that shows like this is where we're at in relationship to the sun or some shit. I don't even know, but it's this gold disc that we really sent out into space. Like right, you can look it up right now, and uh, that was kind of the idea too. It's like, damn, what would you put on the disc? I mean, what kind of maniac decides that's a smart <laughs> idea? This is where we are, guys. Yeah, Our right, technology yeah. is so good that we had yeah. to send out a gold disc. We couldn't yeah. send a human. We couldn't do that. We just had to send out this thing that plays. Okay, it's pretty cool that it ta passed the test of time and that we can do that. But also, like, what crazy motherfucker was like, here we are. Hello. We don't even know what it could be. I'm I just think it's, I think it's crazy that, like, we got it sent out. You know, like who who in the boardroom, who at NASA or like in the Pentagon was like, yo, all right, we're going to we're going to take all our ideas and like put them on a disc and we're going to launch that bitch into space. <laughs> like, you know, that shit is crazy. And then they got it passed and then they made it. And then they probably had to have meetings about like what songs, you know, like I mean, that'd be a cool meeting. I love meeting. that. Idea. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Literally, as you said, I was like. I wonder yeah. if I just have this imagine imaginary thought of like these old white dudes who are like, nah, nah, man, we got to put Jay Z on there. We have to put Jay Z. Someone else is like, if you don't put Tupac, I'm gonna punch you in the face. And they're yeah. arguing about like these hip hop geniuses, but like yeah. it's just the complete opposite. It's just these old crusty white dudes. That would be so funny to see to me, just being like. How dare you? This is hip hop gold. You have to put it on there. I'm trying to see. I'm trying to see what what songs if there was any hip hop on there. I don't. I don't remember what year they sent this out. Uh, if anybody wants to look it up, it's it's uh, called the Golden Record, and it was on Voyager. This is crazy. I'm about to go do. I'm about to go look again at all this shit. <laughs>
Uh, it's it's crazy the shit that we come up with as humans. But man, I think this leads actually perfectly to my last question. Actually, I have one more question. When's your actual birthday? December twenty eighth. Twenty eighth. Oh, that's soon. Yeah. I'm I'm January fifth, yeah. so it's we're close. Let's go. Ha- it's happy early birthday. <laughs> yeah, and to you too. Um, but here's my last question. Uh, it's the only question that I actually plan on the show, but it's probably the hardest question <laughs> I ask on the show. But if you had to recommend one album that everybody should listen to at least once, can be any genre, cannot be your own music, what would it be? Oh, God. Mm-hmm. You better have like four minutes of silence. Dude, what? Well, all right, what is yours? I don't have one. I've never answered the question. Nah, you don't I've need never because <laughs> it's up. it's my show and I make the rules yeah, on my yeah. show. Um, but right. uh, look, I've had uh, honestly a lot of people. Most people are like, "Are oh, you fucking asshole? How? Why did you ask me that question?" Yeah. But I'm the fastest person out. ever was Kyle Lucas. He came out with Equemini by our cast instantaneously, Great. so quickly. And then I just don't, I don't have anything that's like, I don't have anything that's like this embodies, this is the one, you know, it's like. But is there anything ah, that you think is like, like the the way I can explain it is it's not the, it doesn't have to be the greatest project, but it's something that you think people should, should appreciate. And there's something that it, it may mean something to you that you think is underrated. I'm not asking for what's the best album. I'm just asking for something that's, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, one of the most impactful albums to me was To Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick. So that'd probably be, if I have to give an answer off top, that's probably what I'm giving. Just because I think there's a lot of different, like, there's a lot of different, like, things to that question. Like, you know, is it the music or is it, like, the message or is it the, you know, like, and I think that has, like, a good balance of all of that. Um, And that, the convo they do at the end, actually, it's crazy. The convo they do at the end has that concept I was telling you about in that conversation with Tupac that they made with like Kendrick and Tupac having a convo. Um, he mentions that thing of like, by the time you're however many years old, like you kind of lost your drive. So yeah, I think that'd be my answer, I guess. Well, I love that answer because look at, look at you making this, this conversation come full circle. Like from, uh, you, from- you plan that. I'm not, I'm not buying it. <laughs> Look, if I'm smart enough to plant all these seeds to create a conversation, I think you're giving me way too much credit. But, man, it's been an yeah. absolute pleasure. I'm glad you're, you're starting to do interviews, and I'm glad that this is one of the first you've done. And you said you weren't oh, yeah. great at talking about emotions and feelings. I think you did an awesome job. So definitely Appreciate keen it. to see you keep doing it. But for everyone, that please check him out. Follow him on all the socials you've got cool visuals as we said moonlight madness as well is probably one of those deep cuts but 24 minute yeah. video i'm a fan so everyone check it out but hath no fury uh just came out you're gonna see the b-side come out probably yeah. it's gonna be out already it'll be and out. then it'll be out and then and then there's gonna be more projects so make sure you check him out don't miss out follow him um but man absolute pleasure it's great to hear what you've been doing and just looking forward to seeing you keep doing it and keep growing as an artist, man. Appreciate you. You, uh, you're Australian based, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I want to, my goal is by next year to have an Australian tour and a UK slash like Europe tour. So I hope, I hope I get to get out there. (laughs) Me too, man. We'll just have to do this in person then. For real, for real. That'd be fine. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we won't have to deal with the the tech and recording and it'll just be us sitting on a couch. I think that's the one thing this is missing. Can you hear me? Adjust. Oh, no. Yeah, all good. It just cut out. Look at that for timing. <laughs> Literally, I cannot hear a word, but I know that he's – he. so for anyone that misses this, he can hear me, but I can't hear him – but he said he's going to record on his side and he's going to send it through. But, um, yeah, weird how that worked out for timing. Literally, we wrapped up perfectly. Yeah. 
I have no idea what the fuck you just said. So I appreciate you, man. <laughs> we'll speak um, offline. And yeah, as I said, absolute pleasure.